morning, everybody. Everybody meaning 12 people so far, 13. Okay, we're good. Uh, we shall wait uh, like two, three minutes to get more people attended, attending, sorry. And then we shall start with our um, interesting theme. Hey, good morning from my side as well. Hello, good morning. Okay, until we get uh, more people attending, um, anyone uh, letting us know why you decided to attend uh, this um, this panel, this so uh, yeah, this this Zoom meeting. What are what are your expectations for the next one hour? Maybe you can use the chat functionality. Mm -hmm. if you don't feel comfortable, you know, speaking. <laughs> We have a good morning from somebody from Irina. Good morning, Irina. Welcome. Cred că trebuie să schimbăm, să trăsăm eu aici. Da. Da? Ok. Ok. Good morning, Ilinka. Good morning, good morning, Ari. So, anyone letting us know what expectations you have for the next uh, hour? I would like to see your position about this subject. What others think and what trends we have now in our industry? Okay. Thank you, Juana. Hello, Alexandra. Okay, I think that, do, can you, Andre, can you hear us well? Yeah, it's all good. All because good. we need to, we, yeah, okay, good. So it's uh, 11 and three minutes, uh, let's, uh, let's start. Um, I have chosen this subject uh, that uh, is called Great Attrition versus uh, Great Attraction uh, because I was inspired by a recent article uh, published by McKinsey that is tackling this subject of, um, of great resignation. Uh, that it's, it is this uh, time that we are passing now through uh, that is about people shifting to uh, different needs and values uh, like um, you know valuing more being healthy valuing more having a meaning having connection rather than getting a promotion or um, a better salary and it is uh, in Romania, we don't have studies, but worldwide, um, there was never such a big uh, number of people, millions of people uh, quitting their jobs, uh, deciding to take sabbatical. Uh, what is very new is that people are leaving jobs without having any job uh, lined up. They just decide that, you know, this I, ha I have enough and uh, I decide to move on. What is also very new is that people become um, have become uh, location agnostic. That means that it doesn't matter for them where they are living, from where they are working, uh, which is very, very new. Uh, in a nutshell, what we sense that happened and what uh, McKinsey is uh, nicely outlined is that we have shifted our values from uh, the this is the left side, the left brain that is um, preoccupied by being very pragmatic, by having KPIs, uh, envisioning the future, controlling the future, having a sense of controlling the future, 
being preoccupied by promotions, by uh, getting more money. So that switch from, from the left side of the brain to the right side of the brain that is more preoccupied with connection, with meaning, with empathy, uh, with what matters at the end of the day. Uh, and that is um, actually, you know, recalibrating totally the, the work environment, the way we relate and the way we work. And this is what we would like to tackle in the next uh, hour or so. And for this, I have invited uh, Juliana Stan, uh, now Juliana Foka. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, she is um, managing, leading uh, an organization uh, that is called Human Synergistics. It's the only um, instrument that is uh, measuring the unseen in the organization, and that is the organizational culture. In a nutshell, when we say organizational culture, we, see, we, we say the way things are done in a company, from beliefs, values, connections, and so on. Uh, so that is Juliana with uh, Human Synergistics and Andrei Romanescu, that is more known, I guess, in this community. Uh, he's um, the head of Veeam in Romania and uh, has started uh, many companies in this sector from, in this sector, from uh, zero to hundreds of employees. So we will start with Juliana. Uh, Juliana, from your perspective, how... How is this uh, period affecting the organizational culture? You know, I'm like the man who wrote only one book and we'll talk only about that. Everything okay. is related to organizational culture. Mm -hmm. So I had the, the privilege to uh, came in contact with this uh, domain, organizational culture, 15, 17 years ago when I had no idea what that was meaning. Uh, in those times, and uh, I uh, started basically to uh, set the ground in uh, in Romania about uh, about this topic. And uh, uh, I will uh, say something very very arrogant, but I'm not losing any occasion to mention that uh, I'm uh, um, one of the few people start did the conversation about organizational culture in Romania as uh, Mihaela is, and thank you for inviting me at this panel today. Mm -hmm. um, what I want to, um, to say, it's a few words about the organizational culture, because I noticed that if 15 years ago, nobody was talking about the organizational culture in Romania, now everybody is talking about organizational culture in Romania, and it's a topic highly, highly inflated if you ask me what what do you mean that it's highly inflated in in which sense people are talking a lot about it and uh, not doing all the time uh, okay all mm -hmm. the time the proper things related to culture because it's so easy as we are saying uh, the organ organizational culture is the uh, principal guilty of what is not working and mm -hmm. if something is working in a company people don't mention not necessarily culture. the organizational mm -hmm. culture. So, um, as um, as you are saying, Human Synergistics is the most prolific company in the world. They have uh, 50, 50 years research uh, experience in this domain, um, and uh, they develop the most known inventory measuring the organizational culture, which is called Organizational Culture Inventory (OCI). And uh, they they did they did a lot a lot of research on this on this topic. And in Romania, we are using this methodology for uh, as I was saying, 15 years. And we have we have uh, a lot of insights and uh, data related to how this organizational culture is helping companies to success okay. or uh, mm -hmm. fail. And uh, is. Uh... I, one of the reasons for which I invited, uh, I wanted to invite Juliana in this top in this discussion in this panel, is that a uh, couple of weeks ago, uh, Human Synergistics has launched in Romania 
a um, countrywide survey regarding uh, measuring the organizational cultures of companies in the pandemics. Um, in a nutshell, there are three types of organizational cultures is the constructive one, the aggressive one and the defensive one. Very, very, very few organizations have a constructive organizational culture. Juliana, tell us about the, the survey and from your work in the pandemics, what is the tendency regarding organizational cultures? Uh, so, uh, this survey you are talking about is a national research, mm -hmm. we are calling it national research, uh, aimed to understand three major uh, topics. What is the link between leadership and culture, if it is any and how it is created, if that exists, so the link between leadership and culture. The second one uh, is how is the mentality of Romanian employees now in 2000 in 2021 compared with the data we have from previous research we, we've done in uh, 2008 2011 so how the mentality is now and if it's any change, change. Mm -hmm. in the in the past years considering we've been through a lot of crisis periods and uh, yeah we have the financial crisis in 2009 we have the uh, medical crisis now also the pressure for digitalization and a lot of uh, other mm -hmm. pressures uh, related to technology so uh, the second topic was the mentality how it is now what uh, Romanian employees want expect and how they feel they uh, have to behave in the organization they work in order to survive and fit in because this is the definition of culture surviving and, and fitting and fit in. in yes if i will come to work in any of the companies you are representing representing the answer to the question okay now juliana i'm working in this company how should i behave in order to survive and fit in to this place the okay. answer to this question is the organizational culture Okay. and we are analyzing it in the cause effect relationship so i will go to the third mm -hmm. and the last uh, um, goal let's say yes. of uh, research is to see which are the employees aspirations in terms of we have a concept of ideal culture but mm -hmm. is the desired culture what people want from their um, workplaces so we have this three main uh, questions to respond we are doing this research because uh, we are curious about organizational culture and we want to give uh, information back to the to the community are there any differences i mean gut feeling what are the differences in people's mentality and consequently in the organizational culture in the pandemics versus when you did this research in uh, 2008 2011 you said uh one it's not related at all with the pandemics is uh the competitive mentality it was extremely extremely aggressive the way people compete with each other in back 2006 2007 2008 oh, nice. now mm -hmm. it is not so emphasized anymore people still struggle to win to be right to um be the first but mm -hmm. not as it was in 2009 when we did the uh, uh the first research so they culture. care more about if they are okay rather than if they are yes. okay compare it to somebody else yeah they mm -hmm. switch to learning okay what have i learned from this it, again okay. it's not a total shift but yes. it's extremely extremely uh better than it was yes. uh, 10 mm -hmm. 10 12 years ago that is one that is one Another and tendency? in terms of uh, tendencies i would say we are on the international track in terms of attraction and attrition because uh, what i see in our uh, organizational diagnosis reports for example we have two parameters uh, as, as outcomes for the culture intention to stay and job insecurity if before the pandemic time job insecurity was an issue and intention to stay was not. I mean, people wanted to stay in the organization, but they felt somehow job insecurity because they, they felt the pressure of uh, uh, providing KPIs to be the best, to um, perform in the um, 
rational uh, topics you mentioned. And, I mean, they wanted to achieve results, to be the best, to uh, resolve their tasks. Um, what is uh, what is happening now? And what I've seen from the data, and also it's a mention, the companies concerned about the organizational culture are coming to us, not the bad companies, the good companies are coming to us. This is also an interesting issue because uh, to, to have, to have uh, the organizational culture in mind and to, to do something about it, uh, it's it, the first step to it, yeah. It's to the first step. It. So mm -hmm. what I'm talking about it's uh, it's uh, uh, having in mind good clients and good cultures. But also in this good clients, good cultures, what I've seen in the in the reports we've run last year and this year, it's a uh, it's a shift. I mean, uh, the intention to stay started to decrease, and this forty percentage from McKinsey or from the Microsoft survey, because it's okay. the same number, 40%, 40 percentage. 40 percent for intention to, to stay. To stay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So th they don't keep the intention to stay, to stay anymore as much as it was before. Mm -hmm. But also job insecurity is not a big issue. It's not a big issue. No. Why? No. Maybe because it's an employee's market now. Oh, Maybe okay. they, they started to feel they have the power. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, the pan pandemic period just made this more bold, let's say. I, I mean, si situation started to become like that mm -hmm. three, four years be before the pandemic times, but it was a taboo topic. Yeah. No one was talking. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. It was, no, 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 we don't talk about that. But now during pandemic, because people, I don't know if they uh, took more courage, but they just become more aware about uh, their needs yeah staying and talking with mm -hmm. uh, themselves at home they uh, they realize that they have options okay. and uh, that this is, is happening yes we have a question uh, from uh, alexandra where are the results of the survey available or how we can obtain them mm -hmm. And uh, I would like you to reflect on the answer but now uh, and we, to come back yes to 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 this uh, don't forget to answer, but after we yeah. ask Andre, Andre, how do you view now the, the in your opinion, what has changed uh, during the pandemics in terms of people and organizational culture versus before the pandemics? Um, you know, it's pretty interesting. I, I, I think that the world it has changed. OK, so. The, the world has changed, the, the world is changing these days. And I do believe we, we need to understand the context first and the bigger scheme of things. So in the bigger scheme of things, you know, on top of the pandemic that the way I see things is, okay, fine. The pandemic has changed the, the way we work, but there are some trends developing lately which we, we need to consider in, uh, in the current context. And when I talk about trends, and I know there was a question about, uh, or a comment about, uh, about trends, uh, a few things I, I wanted to, to highlight. One is the, the famous new normal, okay? This is to me a trend and it is very complex. The reason the new normal is complex is because that there's a mix of things in there, starting with, you know, fear, financial insecurity, uh, shortage of supplies in some industries. Um, it could be, you know, some simple and new topics as well, like, you know, uh, demand is higher in some industries and supply is limited. Um, the new complex, uh, sorry, the new normal is complex because of, you know, mental health challenges. Sometimes we talk about domestic violence. So this is, you know, the new normal, which creates a context and the reason for me saying that the world is changing. Now, some other trends. Um, we've spoken over the last 18, whatever number of months about digitalization, digital transformation, digital economy. So digital everywhere. This is another trend. Um, something interesting would be the technology side of the game and technology is having an impact on the way for example in our industry uh, we categorize the tasks so 
so far we've been talking about you know routine or non-routine type of tasks but in the new world we we start talking about a different set of tasks like manipulation tasks creative intelligence tasks um social intelligence tasks where we need to use our you know abilities negotiation skills and stuff which cannot really be done by by the machines so technology has somehow uh, shifted the, the way we, we categorize the, the tasks. And, you know, with, with technology, uh, it, it, it comes a, a bit of a challenge because automation uh, in the current context of, of COVID-19 is actually creating uh, what I like to call a double disruption uh, for, the, for the workers in the marketplace. And again, this is probably, I mean, it's not just Romania, but um, across the globe. Uh, the pace of technology adoption is is really uh, expected to to accelerate, and you know automation, COVID, um, double disruption, meaning that there is a chance that if we do not act proactively, inequality is likely to to happen in in the society. So. This is, um, you know, this is very, very complex. And um, for our organizations, uh, I was reading um, the World Economic Forum uh, report about the future of work, and and they are predicting that by uh, 2025. So this is just, you know, 40 years in front of us. Uh, there will be a, a significant skills uh, gap because you know, close to 100 million jobs will be created in areas like, you know, technology, cloud, automation, artificial intelligence. At the same time, 85% million jobs, they are predicting to kind of disappear, which is mainly around, um, you know, transactional type of activities. Uh, those are impressive numbers, but apart from the numbers, I think what is really interesting in terms of the skill gaps is that the, the estimation is that 50% of the workforce will need some reskilling in the next four to five years. So I'll just pause here because uh, I know uh, Juliana would like to probably answer the, the question before. Uh, in a nutshell, to me, uh, the world is changing. We need to understand the context uh, because we have a new normal, which is very complex. We have a lot of trends um, happening around us, and I'll, I'll just, you know, continue with some of those trends uh, later on. And, and to me, this is the first step in terms of how organizations should adapt to the new, uh, the new way of, uh, of working and dealing with employees and uh, thinking of what is the organizational culture that we, we would like to create. So I'll pause here and, you know, Juliana, if uh, you want uh, yes. Yes, um, uh, uh, Andre, you have also a question from Alexandra. Uh, which areas of labor do you think will be most affected? If you would like to take the question sure. now. Yeah, I would say uh, mainly the, the type of activities that are uh, transactional. Uh, we talk about, you know, even accountants. So the, the, the simple routine type of tasks, those will be the, one, uh, the ones who uh, will be affected. Uh, I remember in, in that World Economic Forum report, uh, they are talking about um, the bank transactions, like the tellers uh, in, in, in the bank uh, that we, you know, we, we used to, to get to meet in person. It no longer happens, at least in Romania. I know a few banks which you know, have decided not to put a face in front of a customer, but rather some machines. So those would be the, the most affected. I think you know, the, the important thing would be to think about the the type of jobs that will be created as well. And those are mainly in the in the technology space, uh, but also on the creative side of the game, which creative type of activities and social intelligence, they cannot really be dealt with by, by technology and machines. We, we need the brain. We need skills, we need emotions, we need empathy. I mean, those, you know, human being uh, feelings we mm -hmm. need in the game. Okay, thank you, Andre. Sure. Uh, Juliana, um, you mentioned that you have done this study about uh, 
our mentality as uh, employees in Romania and so on uh, in 2008-2011, right? Mm -hmm. uh, can Alexandra find our, our yep. audience anywhere this uh, the yep. results of the survey? Yeah, yep. uh, we have the result results of the previous surveys. Uh, I will maybe we can write in the chat. It's uh, the name of the website hosting now the national research is Cercetare Națională of the Romanian people is www.cercetarenaționale.ro or the translation of national research in Romania. Uh, also, the um, uh, the website is uh, in English, so we have the English version. This is for the current research, but on this uh, on this website, you will see the previous uh, research we've done on organizational culture, published in 2009, and on leadership, published in 2011 about the current survey it is open so i'm inviting all of you interested in that to help us with data it doesn't matter the size of the company the domain you are activating in the, doesn't matter mm -hmm. what ki kind of uh, company you are representing we are uh, welcoming all the companies uh, helping us with data everything is for free but mm -hmm. more we are and confidential giving, I and guess. confidential mm -hmm. all the time all, everything we are doing is confidential mm -hmm. and um, also we will give back some time with a senior consultant to interpret the data we are collecting from you if you are interested but all the information are on the um, research uh, website at cercetare nazionale mm -hmm. yes okay mm -hmm. good now, guys, I uh, I am intrigued by uh, by an issue regarding people. Uh, speaking about attrition and attraction, uh, as far as I know from our clients and what I see around is everybody is in the attrition mode, or the majority of the companies are in the attrition mode. It's like fixing, uh, you know, trying working hard to to keep to uh, not motivate people to do their job uh, and what i see from the from this this new approach uh, that employees have versus their work is that they consider this approach as being very transactional i mean they are not touched anymore by a bonus by uh, okay i give you money to buy uh, to buy yourself a chair and a nice desk to work from home uh, it is more like they want to have this sense of belonging. They want to deeply connect with the people that they work with, their manager, and to have a, a meaning, their work to have a meaning, right? So um, what is your view on this uh, topic that is very challenging, attrition versus attraction? Because we don't know how to use our right brain, right? I mean, we live in a world that is more about KPIs, buying a car, having a family, uh, having the best vacation ever, we are not equipped so much on being a sage rather than being led by our saboteurs. So what is your view on that? Uh, in what order you would like to answer, Andre or Juliana? Andre first. Okay, please. And, and, and Mihaela, uh, the, the one thing that you you missed mentioning is, you know what, not being in the office anymore, uh, for at least for a lot of, uh, of us, uh, you know, snacks are missing, fruits are missing, you know, massage in the office is missing. So that creates an even more challenging uh, environment. Now, uh, just to connect a little bit with, uh, with what I said before, um, Okay, so the new normal is very complex. So the, there's a, a debate and a, a balance between attraction and, and retention. And to me, uh, the name of the game actually has three words. Uh, one is trust. The second one is empathy. And the third one is empowerment. So in other words, we need to learn to be more human than before, not because we are not humans, don't get me wrong. It's because the current context dictates it even more than before. So those three uh, points are to me critical uh, to make sure that you know we are no longer, or not no longer, but we move from being in the fixing mode to kind of you know prevention or retention. Now, 
to build trust and empathy and empowerment, we need to listen. And I don't know how much time, and you know, I'm just looking at myself as well. I'm not just putting myself outside of this conversation. I don't know how much time we put into a really and real listening to our people. You know, I remember it was probably 1997, one of the first training programs I attended on customer service skills. It was, you know, this telecom company called Connex at that point in time. And I still remember in that training program, the trainer telling us, hey, we have been uh, given two years and one month. So we should look at the proportion and we should listen more than we speak. So to me, building that trust and empathy and empowerment really needs us to think about, okay, what are the mechanisms we, we have uh, in the organization to really listen? And this is not just to leaders and managers. No, this is to all of us at every uh, single level. Uh, Andre, I, uh, very concretely, how do you do this? I mean, it sounds very philosophical. Uh, you know, I need to listen more. Yeah. How, and I totally agree with you, but how is a company doing this very concretely so that it touches everybody in the company? Yeah. So uh, two or three things coming to mind. We should have regular and frequent check-ins with our employees. Uh, the second thing that comes to mind, and this is one of my learning points from um, the last 18 months, we need to reach out intentionally to connect and listen. It doesn't happen anymore uh, at the water cooler, okay? So reach out intentionally, set up some conversations with your people. This is just common sense, but because we are so spread out, there is a risk that we no longer do that intentionally. Um, the other thing is um, the two-way feedback. Okay. This is even, even more important. So in a conversation with somebody, a peer, manager, a direct report, ask for feedback on, on both sides. Um, I've seen initiatives around uh, coffee roulette. Coffee roulette means there's an application where people from around the world in an organization, they just uh, subscribe and the roulette, which is random, they just pick, the roulette picks two people from different parts of the world, it puts them together. So those are some initiatives, which in the past, I don't think we, we really used to, to have them in place. So, you know, just, just a few of those uh, very simple things um, that we can put in place. Mm -hmm. Because being so spread out, probably we, there is a risk of losing that discipline of speaking okay. and talking mm -hmm. to each other. Mm -hmm. Got it. Uh, Christina is, is asking a question. Uh, uh, how do we now keep the company culture in this new hybrid setup? Because this is the tendency so far and that with wave four, it is obviously that it's here to stay. So how, how, how do you do that from your angle, Liliana? Culture is something very, very hard to build. Uh, when we talk about good cultures, we call them constructive culture and being a constructive, constructive culture is not something easy. Constructive cultures are very hard to build and to maintain. So in terms of, uh, uh, a company culture keeping, mm -hmm. keeping the culture the answer is uh, it's very brutal what i will say now if the culture was good we will have it uh, also in those times and uh, people will adapt and will uh, uh, respond easily to the new requirements this is happening in good cultures because if you can show me one company with good constructive culture facing attrition issues for example okay i'm 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 open to to have uh, a debate and, and i'm curious to see if uh, such companies exist so what you are saying is that if a company has a constructive culture they do not have attrition they are about attraction Less. because this is a, yes, a of constructive course. organizational Absolutely. culture. Absolutely. I'm not mm -hmm. saying they don't have at all, but they don't have this problem. They don't have an issue. An issue, that. like mm -hmm. an issue. So, mm -hmm. uh, uh, so the good cultures um, definitely adapt and knew how to face uh, the, the, this new context. And uh, the other type of cultures, the passive aggressive cultures or the cultures like in constructive styles, 
maybe maybe start it to do a lot of micromanagement. This is what I've seen um, everywhere during the pandemics. During the pandemics. Okay. Yeah, when people started to go and work from home, leaders they only knew how to the the, the um, only way uh, mm -hmm. for leaders on how to continue their job for the company was to to do a lot of micromanagement with the uh, with their people so and checking on them putting yeah. pressure making sure that the time sheets uh, yes. okay. yeah, mm -hmm. um, things mm -hmm. like that because because uh, in the uh, passive, passive aggressive cultures people remain focused on task yeah because okay we have to do this 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 and this and mm -hmm. this is fine it's it's a way of solving what it is to be solved in a company, but people need more than that. I mean, okay, work, working from home uh, cannot uh, facilitate people in having uh, empathy from uh, their peers, uh, see the trust in, in the real sense of, uh, mm -hmm. of trust. They don't have interpersonal relationship. And also what is happening is that the companies I remember also the times that uh, Andre was uh, mentioning when Dialogue and Connex were <laughs> the most uh, desired companies to, to work uh, to, to work for. Um, it was a lot of investment in people education at those times. When the, the crisis, financial. when the financial crisis came in 2009, people started to be focused on achieving numbers. I, Irrespective of the domain, people just started to uh, to uh, uh, to strive for uh, achieve numbers, to uh, do tasks, and they completely forget the organization completely forget to reinforce the need of educate people because people are educated also after they finish their formal education in schools, in colleges, and whatever. Mm -hmm. And companies just remain focused on how to survive after the financial crisis. It, and they completely forgot their responsibility because it's a uh, it's still a company responsibility to educate the employees. So what you are saying is that in a passive aggressive culture, uh, leadership the, the leaders are task oriented, yeah. and in a constructive organizational cult cultures, leaders are people oriented. Not necessarily people, they are both people and task oriented. Both, both people, people and, and task. task because mm -hmm. still the companies have to do what they have to do. We, we, uh, in the constructive culture, we don't uh, cancel the importance of doing what is the purpose of company to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's important on how we relate to people. And uh, it's important, for example, if I will go to work for a company and if I have an idea on how to improve something in my domain, yeah? And if I go, for example, to you and say, look, Mikhail, I have this idea. And if you will say, oh, what a, an interesting idea, let's see what can we do about this. That will go and lead the road to a constructive culture. Or if you say, oh, Diana, no, no, no ideas here, because you'll come with a new idea. Maybe you will have a lot of work, extra work to do. Uh, good ideas are not appreciated there. Uh -huh. So this is in terms of systems, how we can lead the constructive culture because again like organizational culture same empathy and trust are overrated words and people don't know how to operate to, to operationalize those because it's not about deep psychology empathy empathy it's about uh, having a rational understanding of your needs of your uh, concerns of your uh, desires it's not something we, we, it's not in the sense of uh, psychology, yeah, we have to oh, I have to empathize with the to understand my childhood and so no, on. no, okay. no, because we are okay. grown up people now, so this is solved in, in another place. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what happens with us when uh, when we are a child? But uh, it's important to create the setup, to create the setup, and we are to to develop the constructive culture because constructive culture is not something that will create just like that from nowhere. We have to take care how decisions are taken in companies. If people perceive they have or not some influence in the decision. If, the, if their opinions matter, if, if their, their initiatives opinion, matter. Yes, at, mm -hmm. their, at, at their level of responsibility and competence. Sure. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's important. This this uh, it's a systemic approach. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not only I don't know to be kind with people and to, um, to be pleasing uh, to pleasing mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. No, it's about understanding. Okay, if people have ideas of how they can improve their uh, their jobs. What is happening in this setup? If people have the perception that what is happening in the company they are working for, everything is fair. It's important to have the perception of fairness in the company in terms of salary, uh, development, um, 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 how called development um, opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, um, if I am a uh, um, reward, for something I'm doing well. Mm -hmm. So it's all, okay. all at systemic level. It's not only about doing small things. It's, it's extremely important, but all this can be translated in the, in, in the infrastructure of the organization. So people, so organization will encourage the development of constructive culture because that will take time. Now we are, uh, again, in terms of attraction and attrition, the attrition, will get worse until it gets better, you know? I mean, now people are seeing, okay, attrition, it's a big issue for us. Oh, being aware of that will not solve the problem yet because to build a constructive culture takes time. Maybe okay. it will be, I don't know, one to year period mm -hmm. to, to start going in the direction uh, of a constructive culture. Okay. And, and just to, to complement what Juliana just said. So in terms of, um um the, the micromanagement which is you know unfortunately uh, something that we've noticed as a result of the you know pandemic and working from from anywhere um, um it's true we need to focus more on you know enabling people versus controlling but the managers felt like they you know the the, the fear of losing control so they started you know micromanaging I, i've seen initiatives like uh, you know, on top of the operational weekly meetings between the manager and the team members, uh, a dedicated meeting on a weekly basis between the manager and the team members on discussing topics that have nothing to do with the business, which you didn't used to see before the pandemic, like, oh, let's spend one hour in a team setting uh, and talk about whatever. Uh, so this was something new. And this was actually I think a way to kind of complement were to alleviate a little bit more the uh, the reaction on the manager side to control even more. So let's you know let's be human and uh, act on that side more. The other point I wanted to to make uh, based on what Juliana just said: um, over communication, people knowing what's happening in the organization. Uh, I know we are bombarded by different communication channels and stuff, but. Uh, I've always uh, been of the uh, uh, impression that over communication is better than no communication. Now, even more important, when people are not in the office and they cannot talk to each other, even we bombard them with some more communication than before, it is way better than keeping quiet because when you keep quiet and you're at home, isolated in the four walls, you know, conspiracy theories and, you know, all sorts of scenarios can be built up. So this is to me another learning point. Uh, intentionally, let's over communicate to people so that they, they don't lose that feeling of belonging. Let's also talk to them about stuff that has nothing to do with, uh, with the business. Uh, I, I think in other words, uh, and I'll, I'll just shut up in a second, what I'm trying to say is that we, we really need to work on, on building that resilience with our people. And the way we can do that is, you know, starting with the very beginning, let's talk more, let's listen more. And we should be very future focused. I've heard a lot of people at every level in the organization saying things like, oh, I just can't wait to go back to what it used to be. Uh, I'm sorry, it will never be like before. So stop thinking about the past. And this is another way to build that resilience. And, and look in front of you. Uh, I don't want to bore you with, you know, sports stories and stuff, but not sure if you know that in, in, in the Formula One, the driver does not look forward through the windshield. They always look 30% higher on top of the windshield 
because that's how they can see the bigger picture. And people think that when you look through the windshield, you, you have the, the, the visual field so you can accelerate more. And that's not true in Formula One. So we need to act like Formula One drivers. We, we need to raise a little bit and, and look forward. You know, don't look backwards. It will not be yes. like before. I totally agree, yeah. Um, we have a question from Christina. Any retention strategies that you can share to prevent or reduce attrition? Again, I would say people don't leave good cultures and people don't leave good organizations. Uh, know your organization culture. That could be one uh, kind of mantra. Know what you have and try to uh, um, adapt uh, your philosophy at what you have. It's important to know that what kind of culture you are leading in order to build and uh, um, drive it to the constructive direction. So, uh, how do you do that? Uh, I mean, if, if Christina will yeah. ask you, okay, uh, no. how, as a leader, I am subjective. I'm I'm part of the organizational culture. Mm -hmm. It's very, it's a might yeah. be a blind spot. Yeah. How do I view what I what okay. I part of? Okay. So as we are saying at the beginning, we can measure that. I have the feeling I'm healthy, but until I will see my results from Cinevo, let's say, to see how my uh, analysis report looks like, I might okay. So be one bias that I'm it. very very healthy. Mm -hmm. yeah? mm -hmm. So uh, so it's important to measure it, of course and to uh, to be aware of all of the uh, strengths and i don't know i'm not using i, I don't like to use uh, weakness when talking about culture because my philosophy is we have to know what we have in terms of good parts of the culture because if we, if we have something good we can build on what is good on culture mm -hmm. we don't mm -hmm. measure culture necessarily to see what is good and what is bad but to see if we have uh good best practice inside our own organizations because this is happening in departments some departments are working very well some of them no so knowing okay. what we have and control it will will uh, 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 create a huge a huge uh, impact because people are uh, uh, interested in the in uh, in their um, company philosophy in their employer branding and in order to build this we need to know what we have I, I strongly okay, so don't the, see first, the first thing is to measure it to measure and, to and then it. second to see for example to define what is the potential we call it ideal culture in our terminology okay. but it's about what is our potential because it's important for each company to define what on how this company wants to be. For example, if I'm in the uh, this field of organizational culture, maybe I don't want to be, um, I don't know, um, 100 employees companies. Maybe I want to remain at 10 employees companies doing significant uh, work for uh, mm -hmm. uh, for those interested in organizational culture. So it's important to know what is the desired uh, outcome. How, culture and potential, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. what, what they want. And the third will be to fill that gap between mm -hmm. what they want and what they can be, okay. they can be, because we are not saying you can be like that, because maybe you can, you, you want to be something bigger or something smaller than a consultant can imagine. So then will be to work to fill in that, uh, that gap between the real potential the company is having and the current situation. Mm -hmm. Because what, what always it's important, mm -hmm. uh, and people don't come to talk with us about culture. They are coming and talking to us about uh, the lack of motivation of people, the uh, conflicts within the company, the uh, efforts which are uh, bigger than the outcome, which are effects of culture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yes, Andre, I want your view as well, please. Yeah. Um, so, so maybe two two things to to add on top of what Juliana just said. Um, preventing attrition. Uh, one thing: uh, be human. Please be human one to the other. Peer level, manager level, direct report level. It is a period of time where we need to talk more to each other, 
to understand ourselves because by doing that, we keep the connections going. People stay for people, like Juliana mentioned. So we need to be close to them, but we need to be human. Operational side of the game, that's fine. But let's add intentionally that human side of the game as well. So this is one thing. The second thing, which might sound a little bit uh, theoretical, but in practice, it will help trigger some ideas. Uh, the second thing is, let's keep ourselves informed of what's happening in the bigger world. What I mean by that is, you know, the trends I was talking about earlier. We need to understand that, the, you know, in Europe, there is the, the aging trend. So what's gonna happen in five, 10 years from now? How, how do I take some actions and what type of actions to make sure that aging will not impact my operations? We need to understand things like, you know, the, the span of attention of people, uh, is lower than 10 seconds. So how do I operate in an environment and how do I work with my people where I have less than 10 seconds to capture their attention? Um, you know, trends like, you know, the, the gig economy, understanding that people um, look forward to having more of a freelancing, a freelancer type of a, a work relationship rather than full-time employment. And Mihaela mentioned at the very beginning that in parts in different parts of the world people quit jobs without having another job they just want to go freelancing and this is to me i think uh, um, the, the gig economy uh, trend is potentially a result of this uh, trend called yolo you've probably heard of it you only live once so the 18 months throughout the pandemic uh, have given people time to think about themselves and they realized i only live once so i should take care of myself as well so all of this in a nutshell, if as a leader, and not necessarily, if I do understand that and I equip myself with understanding the bigger context, it might help me produce some actions to keep people within the organization because I understand what are the external factors that might, might impact that. So those two things, the human and let's keep mm -hmm. ourselves up to date. Okay. Um, what I have noticed is that uh, people are leaving jobs without having any idea what they would like to to do in the future is just honoring who they are finding themselves again after a, a turmoil period and just you know just enjoying uh, realigning themselves with life until they come up with something new which which is and it happens at all levels i mean we are not talking about uh, uh, only millennials or Generation Z or X, it's gender free, age, ageless, uh, yeah. it, it doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's about people this time, it's not related to what type of generation are you part of. And, and what is happening, and it's absolutely funny, people are uh, moving uh, from a job to another without going to any interview. They are staying at home, they are finishing a yes. job on Friday, uh, have a new laptop until Monday, delivered mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and on Monday they can start a new job. I, I have, I, I've read about that in, a, uh, in the article of uh, McKinsey and I also have a friend in this situation and he told me, Juliana, I didn't move from my desk. Mm -hmm. I finished what I've done by Friday evening. On Saturday I uh, got a new laptop and on Monday mm -hmm. I started a new job without yeah. leaving the, the desk. Yes. And, and, and I think, Mihail, I want, one thing that I want to I want to um, share with the uh, with the audience, and it might sound like you know I'm I'm patting myself on the back. Uh, with the, the the current company I I work for, uh, Vim Software, uh, I, I made a promise to myself six years ago when we we started uh, building this operation from scratch in Romania, and I promised myself that I will make time to speak with every single individual who decides to leave the organization. Leave apart the, aside the exit interview process, the formal questions, you know, analysis and stuff. Um, I probably su succeeded in, in meeting 90% of them, but the quality of feedback that you get from a very informal and open conversation rather than a scripted exit interview, and there's a question about the exit interview, that's why uh, I'm bringing this up. Uh, the quality is really, really high. People will tell you how they felt in the organization. So it's not about, you know, bitching or, you know, bitching their, about their managers and stuff. So I would encourage all of us on the call who are leaders, 
reach out intentionally to people, talk to them even when they leave, or even if there is a, a process in place for the exit interview. That so tells people that- How you do the exit interview, not that you do it. It's exactly. the way you do it, because it can be procedures based, yeah. only task oriented if you want, yeah. or it can be task yes. and people oriented. I mean, really caring about the exit interview. That's the idea. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that was a question from Andra. Thank you very much. And now we have another question from Alexander regarding the way we communicate during these times and if uh, written communication is um, actually helping more in um, expressing what we really believe, if it gives us more courage. Hmm. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm you it's know, important to uh, communication is important, doesn't matter if it's written or face to face. Of course, if we don't have the chance to do it face to face, written is fine, but still, the interpersonal interaction cannot be replaced of nothing. It's as simple mm -hmm. as that. I mean, uh, we can automatize everything in, in a company, people are growing up and they are developing uh, themselves and the culture they are living in only in the interpersonal interactions. Yeah, yeah. What, what Alexandra was uh, was meaning is that uh, in in this era where we communicate forced by the, the pandemics more in written, is it psychologically more encouraging for us to, this is her question, to express what I like, what I don't like, people were encouraged before to express those feelings, <laughs> yeah, they would continue answer. and they will do it. Uh, if, if I if I was not used to tell how I feel, I will not start. And maybe I will, I will tell if I'm a, uh, uh, in, a, in an aggressive style, they will come to speak the opposite, not necessarily mm -hmm. uh, the good, uh, mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the good words. So, so it, it all depends on the way things were done before. Uh, it written or face-to-face uh, -face will not change anything that the deep DNA of a company. I, okay. I strongly mm -hmm. believe that. Yeah. Andre, you, you wanted also to say something before you, we wrap up this session. I wanted to be very honest with you and, and say that, you know, I have a bit of conflicting thoughts when thinking about written communication versus face-to-face. Uh, -face. Uh, it is conflicting because on one hand side, I did notice that people throughout the pandemic time, uh, they do share their thoughts in writing more than they used to do before. At the same time, if we keep encouraging that type of communication and that channel you know, in writing for the entire population, not just for the ones who are probably you know, uh, introverts and you know, we, we need to make sure that the, the, the channel of communication fits their personality. So if we encourage all of them to, to start writing, my fear is that we will just you know, put people in, in boxes and, and send them away from us, which we, we don't want to do. So I think long story short, what I'm trying to say is that let's adapt the communication style uh, based on the individual personnel. If they want to write, fine. If that's the way to get information from them, fine. But let's not forget about the others who might not prefer that type of uh, okay. communication. Okay. Um, so, um, uh, concluding this uh, past one hour, um, I, I asked uh, Alexandra uh, to, Alexandra that is uh, working for APSLE, uh, to send to all of you the article that I'm talking about, Great Attraction uh, versus Great Attrition uh, by McKinsey. It is really, for me, it was very inspiring and it gives a lot of input and feedback to what we can do differently and the as is and the should be of the situation that we are all in. So I hope that you will enjoy this, um, this article. Uh, don't forget, in case you would like to be part of uh, measuring your organizational culture to um, check the, the site cercetarenationale.ro and reach out to Juliana. And uh, once again, Andre and Juliana, thank you so, so much for, um, 
for for taking the time to debate on attraction and attrition. It was a pleasure for me. And uh, yeah, hope that we will have more fun in the future while attracting people. <laughs> Fingers crossed. <laughs> Okay. Thanks, Mihaela, for the invitation. It was really good. And, and thanks to the audience for the questions. It was really good to get some questions so that we don't feel like, you know, talking to the white space. Yes. Okay. Good. Bye. Take care, all of you. Bye. 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 Bye.